People are going to be destroyed when this economy collapses and they're not going to have the wherewithal to handle it themselves. They're going to be in panic mode, just like when we went through the Great Depression. So we have got to stand up ahead of time and provide them a way that they can maintain value and trade in value and maintain their lifestyles. They now have to keep printing or we crash. We've got this ticking time bomb. Talking gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire. Welcome to Live from the Vault. Hi, my name is Shane Moran, and I'll be your host for this week's episode of Live from the Vault, and welcome to the show that goes beyond the headlines and uncovers the truth about the precious metals industry and the effects on the global economy in these historic times. With exclusive access to experts and insiders, we reveal information and insights that you simply won't find anywhere else. Now, this week, we have the one and only Andrew McGuire, precious metals expert and whistleblower in the vault. And to help him pull back the curtain, we'll be joined by uh, by demand, actually, from our Life in the Vault community, Mr. Robert Keats of Gold Silver Pros. That's right, Robert Keats is in the vault. And uh, you're not going to want to miss this conversation with Andrew McGuire. So just before we introduce our special guest, for those who haven't already met Robert, and before we head over to the UK, please help. Keep spreading the word about this channel by hitting that like button there right now and also share this information and subscribe, subscribe if you haven't already done so. And if you click on the bell, we will notify you in real time as each episode goes live. Now, if you haven't already met Robert, he's one of the show's favorites of gold, silver pros. You know, he's leveraged over 20 years of investment experience across various markets to specialize in precious metals. Through his YouTube channel, he shares insights and precious metals analysis, economic forecasts, and uh, we're really, really happy to have him back. And with that, let's head over to the UK and talk in gold with the one and only Andrew McGuire and our special guest, Robert Keynes. Over to you, Andy. Yeah, Robert, it's 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 so nice to have you back, and and uh, I've enjoyed every time you've come. You are one of my favorite Texans, and and I consider Texans to be the 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 actual cutting edge of. If anyone's going to live anywhere in America, I'd be in Texas because that's the a land of real people. It is, yeah. Texas, you know, we're we're sort of down to earth people uh, originally cattle rancher farmers and that type of thing and you know in the south here in the united states we a lot of the people that uh still make things and do things and uh our culture is a little bit different but i found you know living in texas i, I travel all over the world just get back from toronto and i love I, you know paris is one of my favorite international cities i love the world but i just keep coming back to texas it's just a great place to be yeah well look you just mentioned toronto yes, um i know this was a huge event and and i think you're going to have some intel there for us uh, to sub share with us all, um, so we're privileged to have you here right off the back of that. Um, tell it, to, tell us a bit about what it was and kind of what you were doing there. Yeah, so every year, uh, people from around the world show up in Toronto at the Toronto Convention Center uh, to a program called PDAC. It's a Prospector and Developer Association in Canada, and it's basically essentially a mining conference, but it's a, a mining, a metals. Uh, equipment, bullion dealers, like uh, the Royal Canadian Mint was there and, and I spoke to one of their representatives. So it's a big meaning place uh, for uh, the milieu of people that are, you know, in and around the precious metals industry, all the way going from mining on the far left side of the supply chain, all the way up to bullion providers. And it's a great place to meet people and kind of get the pulse for what's going on behind the scenes. And it's very interesting talking to people you know, in Toronto at PDAC, uh, also had a, a speaking session. So I'll talk about that just really quickly and then I'll get into the intel. So Good. I opened up the Investment Leaders Forum at, at PDAC Sunday at 1030 and I was talking about potential post-dollar uh, currency alternatives. I talked about CBDCs and private cryptos and gold. Uh, there's a movement here in the United States to make gold money again. I'm involved with that. And we think that we're going to get legislation passed in Florida, for example. We're very hopeful in the near future. Uh, so a lot of that uh, is what my talk was about. But the most interesting piece, I mean, people want to know about that. They can go to my channel. But the most interesting piece is just talking to people. And one of the main things that we see uh, is that the baby boomer generation who in the United States holds most of the wealth, and I'm sure it's probably true throughout the Western world, is starting to retire. And they're starting to revolve out of 
a lot of speculative assets, which includes mining stocks and things like that. And they're rolling into safer assets. And so the miners or the producers of the metal are having a really hard time attracting capital. Uh, there's not enough capital going in. Uh, and specifically the younger generations are don't travel to conferences. And so there seems to be a disconnect between the younger generations and the mining sector. And what that has done so far is it's thwarted the ability of the mining uh, complex, mining companies, uh, uh, projects around the world, things like uh, things like that, to produce the metal. And so I think we have a coming shortage of metal. And it, it includes gold and silver. It includes platinum and palladium. I spoke to two platinum and palladium producers there at the conference, one in South Africa, one in Canada. Now, South Africa and Russia are the biggest producers, but Canada has a lot of platinum palladium math, PGM assets. And they can't mine right now because the prices need to hit 1200 or above and both platinum and palladium are trading in the 900 range. So prices are not significant enough to develop new platinum and palladium. So I think we're going to have a big shortage coming in platinum and palladium. And I think it's starting now. But from a gold silver perspective, there was only one, um, I'm sorry, two uh, primary silver producers that I talked to, Silver Corp and Gato Silver, that are actually making money at current silver prices. Most of the juniors and most of the the other exploration companies that are trying to develop new silver supply. They're not making enough money to develop their mines. They're not raising enough money to continue their drilling and prospecting. So the overall, what we call highest grade reserves in the world, proven and probable, are falling in both gold and silver. And that's scary because at a time when the world's going to need it, if you don't already have your gold and silver, it's going to be very difficult in future years to get it unless those prices rise. Now, when the prices do rise, if you look at how the mining cycle works, it takes sometimes five to seven years, even when you have the money coming in, for that to be developed. So there's going to be a gap of time between when the prices are rising, now we're hitting you know, all-time highs in gold again, but between that and the investment coming in and development of new supply. So in the coming economic crunch that I think that we're going to see, there is going to be massive shortages of both gold and silver, along with some base metals, which is going to affect industry and make everything more expensive. So we're going to live in a time in which things are more expensive, even though national production is going down, because cost inputs and commodities are going up, even at the same time that overall deflationary demand is, pull, you know, is pulling demand down across world economies. Prices are still going up. How does this exist? Because we haven't developed the supply for what we need now in the next five to seven years in the future. But specifically to precious metals, when I say shortages, if you've looked at the flows off of COMEX, off of the Shanghai, off of the, the London market, if you look at the LBMA vault statistics, they started to trend down again. They plateaued in gold, silver for a while, at least on public information. Now they're trending down. And world, gold and silver is coming off the world markets. And uh, there's not going to be enough for the average everyday person to get it when the time comes because the supply is simply not there. And so I don't know if it's going to take three to five to seven years for that supply to catch up. But if you're not securing your gold and silver now, it's going to be very, very difficult to get it uh, because of what we see on the front end of the supply chain, the miners, the guys that dig it out of the ground. They're just, there's just not enough money in, in the space right now to produce enough either precious metals or base metals that we're going to need for the economy. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> to put that in just perspective, I hear you. And, and I mean, the thing, thing is, what, what we're looking at is not even that the price of these materials are going up. It's just the amount of debasement of the dollars um, that, that it will require to buy the same ounce of gold, the same ounce of silver, the same, you know, obviously the labor. Uh, and, and when you look at a bar, and I think this is the beauty, and you're, you're in the precious metal business, and when you hold a bar, whether it's a coin, of silver or gold, all the energy that was ever, ever created to make that is in it. There's no counterparty risk to that. Um, it cannot be debased in any way, shape, or form. Every fiat currency that is currently pricing those bars is debasing. So even if I look at my desk here, um, it's going to cost more pounds, euros, dollars to buy another one. So this is ludicrous. And, and it, to me, it amazes me that people aren't in hordes dumping as many dollars, euros, as, uh, as they can, people are saying, "Oh, I've got lovely savings. I've got, right, right. Oh, I've got, a, I've got some savings, and I'll keep those for a rainy day." You know, that isn't a rainy day. The rainy day is here. We need to. You need to be thinking hard. Unless you actually need that physical cash, in my view, unless you actually need it to go down to the grocery store to buy something, 
anything in excess of what of your bills, well, why would it be in a bank that could be bailed in? Why would it be? Why is your money that is being debased in front of you? Why are you holding on to it? And so, Rob, it, 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 I hear you here. You know, it, it appears these these um, metals are going up in price. It's just that it's costing so much more. Yeah, it is. And to your comments, um, you know, the 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 middle class right now is having severe issues making ends meet and their ability to buy precious metals without dumping other assets. If you, if you look at what's going on in the world and explaining inflation, people don't understand inflation when uh, economies are not growing. They think that inflation has to grow with the economy. That's a Keynesian concept. Inflation, if you look at Austrian economics, is really the result of excess money printing. And you can have inflation even when you have deflationary economies. It, it happens. Um, there's been so much money printed, and the U.S. government's been really good at hiding the true number, that it's sloshing around. But what, you know, according to the World Gold Council study last year that I've quoted often, uh, as of July of last year, we were down to 59% of global reserves in the dollar. And as of data, I looked at December, it's 58%. And according to the World Gold Council study from last year, the central banks, I think there was 60 or so in the study, something like that, said that they're going to reduce their holdings down to 40 to 50%. Well, by default, once the dollar falls below 50%, then it's lost its reserve status because now you have the rest of the world currencies making the majority, and that that's supposed to happen in the next three, you know, two to three to four years. And you can see the deleveraging outside of the dollar, the deleveraging outside of uh, U.S.-based uh, Treasury debt, uh, to the point where the Fed has started to guarantee that debt. Now they're doing it a bunch of ways. They're doing a bank term funding program directly to the banks. They're guaranteeing Treasury and and, and that type of debt, mortgage debt, all types of debt. But they're having to buy more in the, in the auction. The Fed's having to buy more. And the world interest in our debt is falling. The world interest in our dollar is falling. And when that falls, all the benefits, Andrew, that the U.S. has had and maybe even our largest trading partners have had because of dollar dominance is going to go away. And now we're going to be fighting with a debased currency against the rest of the world. And consider our manufacturing base has reduced. We're, we're dependent on China, Mexico, Germany for that. So our ability to sort of grow our way out organically of, of this situation is not there like it was post-World War II. Post-World War II, we were a manufacturing nation. We had just become, or in the process of becoming the dominant currency, we had massive gold reserves of 27,000 tons, which we don't have anymore. Uh, people were producing, uh, there were, not everybody had a college degree. People were in our jobs actually making stuff. You had more mom and pop stores and you had more people living in the country that could grow their own food. Mm -hmm. All of those factors have reversed at the exact same time that the dollar is losing its dominance and the West is losing its cultural and political influence at the same time. So what you see shaping up is going to be this very difficult time in which people are used to this standard of living that's just not going to exist anymore because of inflation, but because of a lot of, a lot of other things. And the only way really to make up for that is to have stored your money or bought money or, or purchased actual money that keeps its value over time. And gold simply has done that. Um, one last thing I'll say there, I've done a lot of charting and technical analysis the past few weeks on my channel. Yeah. And we're looking at LA waves and fractals and things like that, some sort of advanced concepts of looking at the market. And so far, I mean, if you look at gold since 1971, it's kept up with inflation. And we say it's in a bull market. Well, essentially it's tracking the monetary supply. When things collapse and ex extra's pyramid inverts and all these derivatives and property and all this stuff flows down to gold and silver, you're going to see the true bull market and that market is going to go absolutely nuts. Why? Because then gold and silver will be representing the increased monetary supply. In other words, they will catch up to their true value and even shoot through it because everybody's going to panic and go and buy it. So actually at some point, I think we'll reach a gold and silver bubble. Well, gold and silver are probably overpriced relative to other things, but the charting looks like that may take 10 years. I think this, you know, if that chart fulfills and if those things come to fruition, like the charting says and the, and the fundamentals of the market seem to be implicating, then we could have a 10 to 12 year bull market in precious metals and it'll be unlike anything we've seen in the modern, uh, era, modern economic era. And uh, I think the world's embracing that. They're talking about gold backed digital currencies. Um, Part of the talk that I gave at PDAC uh, on Sunday was talking about how the central bank digital currencies are being engineered to actually have a 40% gold backing. That's under Project Orem and uh, unitfoundation.org, a couple of different projects going on. They're talking about, well, 
we have to base a global financial system on gold. And eventually they want to move off of gold. But gold is going to be present in the financial system for a very, very long time. It's baked in the cake. It's part of the regulations. It's part of the new design of the new monetary system. So it, it everything points to gold being center stage for what's coming up to one, prevent wealth destruction, to two, to be an, an actual good investment where it does not only tracks inflation, but moves up in value relative to other things very, very precipitously. But also it's going to be the basis for the new financial system, much like it's been the basis you know, for the last 5,000 years. It would just be more explicitly, uh, much like it was during the gold standard. And so gold is going to take center stage and those who aren't in gold are going to miss the boat. You're going to lose a lot of your wealth, I believe, in my opinion, and I believe you're not going to be able to keep up with with the massive inflationary collapse that we're going to have. And I think you'll be behind. You'll be clawing your way out for the next 10 to 20 years. Because if you look at, uh, last thing I'll say, a really long-winded, but if you look at the stock market return post the Great Depression, it took 25 years for stocks to recover. And if you look at those um, recovery periods for the stock market in the U.S., they average 14 to 25 years after a massive collapse. In fact, you know, we didn't get back to stock valuations after the tech crash in 2000 until 2016. You know, even that run up prior to 2008 and the Lehman crisis didn't get us there. It took till 2016. So that took about 15 years. And that was a, a minor economic situation. During major economic depressions, it takes 25 to 30 years. So if you're the baby boomer out there and most of your wealth is being held in real estate stocks and bonds, uh, you may die before those valuations break even after this collapse happens. So it's very likely in your lifetime, if you don't have gold and silver, you'll never have the same lifestyle you're, you have today uh, in March of 2024. And that's something that you need to strongly consider. Uh, what do you do about that? And I think time is running short. Everything from fundamentals to technicals points to the fact that time is running short. And so it's getting to the point, you know, I've been talking about this for 15 years. It's getting to the point where it's not going to be another 15 years. It may not be another 15 months. So the, the sense of urgency people need to consider this information, I think, is rising. And don't wait too long uh, because, you know, as you and I were talking before the broadcast, there are massive shortages that we see in the supply chain for gold and silver. And that's going to come home to roost exactly at the time when the people need it the most. And the central banks are going to be holding most of it. And wealthy individuals are going to be holding most of it. And the rest of us are going to be looking around going, ooh, I can't find gold and silver at any price. And I think that's maybe where we're going to see here in the, in the coming future. Yeah, and I think, you know, <clears throat> you've outlined that very well. And I think this is, this is something, this is about education. This is about um, getting information to make better decisions. And, and really, uh, there's so few people that even think about gold and silver. In your daily life, you know, uh, the average person's daily life, it, it really doesn't come in. Um, and 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 yet, when they look, as you say, you 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 are now witness. As you mentioned, you witnessed people um, actually having to sell, like the middle class having to sell. I think you mentioned scrap silver, anything to to try and raise money. Yep. How sad that makes me when you, when you think if only they knew what the supply deficit was. If only they knew. And we just did an episode about um, the London professional trade, about these, this, the cartel, and, and their presentation uh, back in November of 2022 exposed the fact. They, they did that presentation. It was for silver, the capricious metal, meaning fickle. And yet it was the only fickle thing about it, it, it inconsistent, it means. And, it, and the, only th in, the only inconsistent thing about it was the fact that it's not fetching its real price. And these guys... These guys actually put this presentation out. If you remember back in November um, of, of 2022, there was a massive premiums um, over and above what was being traded. And, and so suddenly, now we're, I'm bringing this to what's current. Now we're experiencing, through all of February, we're experiencing um, our refiners in, and you know, you go to Europe, you go, you go all around the world, uh, Valcambi and Reyes and people phoning us, everyone saying, I have to fill 2,000 tons of Chinese, of Indian, primarily Indian, also Chinese mixed in there, um, physical orders at spot. I can fill them now. Right. Have you got any? And and the odd person I know had, I think one person had 30 tons and that was it. And, it, and they sold it to them, uh, to the refinery. But it's 
2,000 tons of unsupplied gold, uh, silver. What has that done? What are these guys doing? And it's important to understand what these guys, this is a self-named cartel. I mean, they, they didn't call themselves a cartel, but they talk about it's only right to have 100, 100 to 1 leverage. Why? Well, we provide funding to producers. Hey, I can understand three or four uh, times on a rolling basis, uh, but not 100 to 1. And then, so so now, by refusing to deliver, what they've done is actually caused their own demise. Because now, all these same liquidity providers that we that, that we deal with and that we know have said, okay, then, we can't get it. We'll come over to the COMEX. We will buy. I don't care. We, we, don't, we don't care about leverage. We're not going to pay, care about the 93% that we have to stump up. Uh, after we've bought a contract of uh, of silver or as many contracts. And i tell you what, we're buying 3,000 contracts at a time. Why? For physical delivery. We're planning to load these suckers out on the back door. And we're seeing more and more and more of that. And yeah, you can start to constrain open interest to just 3,000 lots per, per, per person. That may have been okay when you had massive open interest. But that open interest is, you know, we've discussed this before. Open interest is declining. Now you've got this kind of this reverse. When you when you un, when you deleverage something, it works works in two ways. And you as an as an accountant, as 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 a, a, a I mean, obviously you you are a, a, a more than an accountant. Yeah, so you would understand how leverage works in two ways. So suddenly you've got this balance destroyed. Now you, the 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 CTAs that they lay. Um, the most of the open interest on that can be relied never to take delivery of silver. It's insig- because they just run on leverage. It, it it's insignificant. They can be rinsed out of a, a range. But if you've got people, unwelcome guests coming in the back door and saying, "No problem, we'll just buy those because we can't." You've starved us of any supply globally. We'll just take what you've got. This is the demise. I see the demise of the Comex. It is not even a year away. I see it as months away because once you've created that kind of, and you just came from a, a conference where you're saying, there's no supply. Uh, we can't, you can't create enough supply at these prices, but there's a buyer and there's always a buyer and a seller at a price. What is that price? Is it 250 bucks an ounce for silver? Because most of these guys are thinking $4,000 gold is a bad day. So at 16 to 1, that's 250 bucks. I mean, uh, uh, to, to be honest, this is the kind of thoughts that run around my head all the time. Yeah, it's interesting. The only place where there's an oversupply and relative to the overall demand, this is very small percentage, is in the American retail market. Um, owning a store, what that's done is it's moved me to the front of the supply chain and dealing with you know the small guy. Whereas I'm used to dealing my analysis from the miners and the comics and all that. And I'm, I've become the bank of Rob. I have bought more precious metals in the last two months in my store than I've been able to accumulate on my own for sure. But to the point of where I don't have any money to buy anymore and I'm having to offer below spot and I don't want to do it, but every dealer in my area is doing the same thing. And I'm connected to a series of dealers across the United States via Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups. And, and I know major wholesalers that I do business with every day, probably five or six business relationships with wholesalers. And the retail, the small end of the retail supply chain in North America is working in reverse. People are selling their heirlooms that they've had for 200 years. We're smashing and melting silver. Um, but that, I believe, if you look at the charts, is going to feed worldwide demand. And there, there are two levels of that. There is the high-end retail in the Western world and across the world. We're talking family offices, those types of guys. Um, I'm speaking with people that want to potentially buy millions of dollars of metals because they're trying to secure their businesses. They believe what what businesses are seeing in the United States is increasing cost of labor, uh, capital requirements, uh, products, and decreased demand from customers, and it's squeezing their business. And they're moving to a safe position in the metals to weather the storm because they know what's coming and they know that they have to account for this inflation, this cost increase. And the only way to do it is to buy gold and silver, gold specifically. So you have high-end retail in the United States buying like crazy. But most of what is being sold by the middle class and, and the poor 
in the United States just gets reworked as metal and it gets put back in the system. And if you back it up and look at the big end, the industrial end, all of that's flowing east. China, India are gobbling it up. It's coming out of the LBMA. It's coming out of COMEX. And it's gold flows from, from west and silver flows from west to east. It's very clear. And also, I think if you're looking at, you know, the big markets, it's very clear that most of, you know, when, when COMEX releases that letter they did a couple of years, a couple, three years ago, which said, for our eligible stocks, we don't know how much is liquid because they're really privately held. They're not really available for trade. So this illusion that COMEX has all this free gold and silver when the, when the CME group, I'm sorry, along with the CFTC has said, well, we don't know how much that's actually liquid. If you look at liquidity in gold and silver, it's a lot less than the reserves that get put out on the charts, you know, in the Western markets. And I believe to some extent that's probably also true for London, although I'm not as familiar with that market. You know, the actual liquid reserves is a lot less than people think. And what I'm saying is uh, I'm also affiliated with the groups that deal with very high-end purchases, central banks, um, commercial banks, very wealthy uh, high-end individuals. Uh, I've, I've done a partnership with a firm that, that moves this kind of metal. And those people are buying gold and silver like it's going out of style. And so you see this just giant sucking up on the high end of the supply chain. And they're sucking it up from retail. They're sucking it up from junk silver coins. They're taking people's you know, silverware from 200 years ago. Wherever they can, literally the whole thing, it's like it's a big vacuum upwards you know, into uh, associations, central banks, wealthy individuals, and the average everyday person is getting rid of it to pay, you know, just be able to make ends meet. And that's what happens in an inflationary environment. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out, one of the key pieces of Intel that I love going to PDEC for, uh, it's an expensive trip for me. You know, it's not, um, it's not inexpensive for me to fly up to Toronto um, and do that as a small business owner, but I go because of this type of Intel one of the companies that I've been to, to site to visit their mine in Sokulpan, Mexico is Impact Silver. Impact Silver is a smaller silver producer, but they have the highest percentage of overall silver out output as, as a percent of the total. They're, they're the most in tuned to the silver market, to the silver price. Well, Tesla basically is funding. Okay, this is interesting. Tesla came to them and is funding one of their projects to get the silver out of it. And because this project is remote and doesn't have infrastructure, they're building Tesla battery walls and Tesla's donating the infrastructure for this mine to secure the silver that they need for their electric vehicles because they can't find it on the market. It doesn't exist. Their companies are going directly to miners now. And not only are they paying for the silver, they're funding the mine for the silver. And they have to. Because the miners aren't getting money from investors right now because people aren't putting money into mines. So what's happened is companies are going directly to the miners to say, I'll buy all of your output. And I will not only that, but I'll, I'll build you a mine because we can't find it anywhere else. There are so many people on the large end of this funnel that are sucking up so much silver that they're going directly to miners now. And that's happening more and more. And there were, um, I'll tell you one other thing that I found very interesting at the conference. Saudi Arabia has largely been an oil and gas state for a long time. They know that their reserves are running out. And I spoke to a company, uh, which is a conglomeration of mining companies in Saudi Arabia. And they said the state has ordered them, has ordered all existing businesses, whether you're in mining or not, to get into mining. So other businesses like construction companies, family offices, are now funding mines in Saudi Arabia so that they can build resource independence. So the state has said, we need to build resource independence. We need our own gold. We need our own silver. We need our own whatever, tin, lead, whatever. And they're much like the Chinese use state-owned enterprises to invest in infrastructure. Saudi Arabia has pulled a page from China's book and they're going to businesses and saying, we'll subsidize you with tax incentives and things like that if you go build a mine and go get silver, lead, tin, gold. Because they see the writing on the wall. Saudi Arabia knows that they need resource independence for what's coming. And the golden, uh, I'm sorry, the oil's not going to be enough. The oil and gas is not going to be enough. So Saudi Arabia has completely flipped the script and they're building their own resources, but they're doing it through investment through companies. And we're starting to see that across the world. Companies, I mean, because 
the retail public's not buying miners right now. There's no flow like there usually is. And so now you have state-owned enterprises, you have governments, you have companies like Tesla going directly to the miners and saying, not only will we buy your output, this is not a royalty or a stream. We'll build you the mine and then we'll buy the output because they have to, because there's not enough supply. And it's not just in the precious metals, it's in the base metals. There are shortages in a lot of things. This, the, the, not only are gold and silver going to explode at some point, but the whole commodities complex is going to go bonkers because for years we have not funded it. We've not funded it. We've put money into tech. We put money into all these other things and we've ignored the commodity sector. And the boom that is coming in commodities is going to reverberate throughout the world, literally. And it's going to cause geopolitical realignment. It's going to cause new trade agreements. And it's going to shock the world what's coming in this commodities boom. And you can see it when you go to conferences and talk to companies. It's just, it, it's obvious what's going on. And hopefully this information is reaching enough people so that people can see the rotation we're getting from the old system to the new system. It's not just the dollar to whatever. Um, it's the old dollar-based inflationary tech, uh, tech, what do you call it? Just people fell in love with all of these other things. But guess what? Tech can't survive without commodities. You can't grow food. You can't do all these things without investment in real things. And so the era of value investing, Warren Buffett investing into real things and commodities is coming back. And it's going to roar back. And it's going to roar back in a big way. And I want to issue a warning to the baby boomers out there because I care about you. I care about everybody. If you're invested in tech and you're invested in all these other things and you're not in commodities, you're going to lose a lot of your wealth in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, it, it's, it's imperative that people, you know, if you want to maintain your wealth, that you invest in markets that are going to grow and the commodities market is going to grow faster than anything, I think. And that's going to include gold and silver. Rob, you just outlined some <clears throat> really important, I mean, there's so many important things you've just outlined, but <clears throat> let me pick up on, this is cutting edge for most people because what you've just outlined here, this intel you've got is bang on. And the thing is, what you've just, really, what do you think of the implications talk about the commodity market in general? But now, what, who has been controlling it? It's been the banks. Later. It's been the RBMA banks. They've had it to themselves. They have played the games. They have literally now, we're in the past, we've tried to get buy silver for, for large clients and even gone to a uh, refinery in Kyrgyzstan and places. And, and they go, yeah, 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 okay, here it is. But all of a sudden you find you're being blocked. UBS, what they did was, was actually put a red flag up on a Swiss, second-tier Swiss bank who was acting as our liquidity provider and literally warned them back off or we'll blacklist you. And this is what they've been doing. So essentially they've had control, but but because obviously you can figure out who's buying what because from KYC, AML requirements, you know exactly who your buyer is. So they know, hang on, he's not one of our, it's not one of the club here. Okay. Hang on, no, you're not getting it. And that's what we just saw with 2,000 tons being refused delivery. 2,000 tons. Think about it. That is not a small amount of silver. How dare you refuse to deliver what is required? Because you don't want to deliver it as spot. Why? Because you're manipulating the price of spot. So what you've just outlined is, except, look, that is great news. I didn't know T Tesla was funding actual mines. This is a this is exactly the front end of what's going on. You as you say, you've got people going directly to the refiners, directly to the mines, mm -hmm. right to the source, mm -hmm. and doing their buy. Who are they excluding here? They're excluding the old cartel. They're excluding the, the game because these guys rely on a paper price. They rely on chasing ranges. They don't it's nothing to do with reality. Uh, I mean, who the hell in their right mind, give your head a shake, 92 ounces of silver to buy an ounce of gold? Come on. This is a synthetic world, a bubble world. It's 16 to 1. It's 8 to 1 probably, but 16 to 1 is being generous. So at $4,000 gold, because you can't do this with gold anymore. Gold, when it became a first-year asset class on the 1st of, uh, of January 2023, you had this realization is it only just fed through to the point where hang on a minute i can go to the comex i can load out through my the efp mechanism i can take delivery it's cheaper than flying it out on a plane 
I can put it through the EFE mechanism. It lands in London in an NSFR compliant deliverable contract at the price it just bought it at on the COMEX. Now, if I went straight to the London market, yeah, I'd have to do a bilateral deal and it'll be a hell of a lot more than the spot price. So this way, it is the Achilles heel. This is what's happening. And Basel III has, although the COMEX isn't Basel III compliant, the guys that are entering it are, and they're yes. taking it out. That's the that's the key, Andrew. That that's the key right there. Yeah, the people that are trading it are not your usual suspects, and they're raiding our markets to get it, or they're going to the miners to get it because they have to, because the cartel, like you said, has controlled that supply for so long. It's forced the rest of the world to kind of gang up on it and say, okay, well, fine, we'll we'll figure out your game. Yeah, and you've just nailed it. And I think people must listen to this because when you think of the implications of that, and and that means the paper game is. Done. It's done. Okay, we, we've got to see a bit of gaming into non-farm barrels. We've got to have some short-term events, but it's done. And because gold is done, you can't, what, what are you going to do? 150 to 1 ratio? Come on. Gold is going to break the ranges. And once you get through certain ranges, which we're very close to, what's going to do is explode that that uh, that, that short position. And, and, and Rob, I, I just witnessed, and, and I just published a chart and showed it, I witnessed a 53 cent premium to to get out of, to the premium being commanded to get out of a spot contract, a spot, uh, literally 53 cent, 2,200 and something actual, it, the cost to get out of a silver trade was 53 cents in value. So suddenly... We're seeing what happened in COVID in March 2020 when COVID caused a shortage. And suddenly you've got people coming in and exactly that. People are coming in the back door and saying, I will take it. And and and, and, the, and the thing is, with the, the only difference is when gold is Basel III compliant, you can put it through the EFD mechanism. You do that with silver, all you're doing is putting it into an unallocated contract and circling it back into the cartel. So... What people are doing is going and loading out at the back door of the Conex. So there's the difference with silver. You can literally take it out of the back door. And that that unwind of leverage, people don't, I think people, I'm trying to get the message here. This isn't a year away. This is months away. At worst, this thing is done. So as I say, this is why I end all my episodes with how much physical have you got, guys? Yeah, it, physical is the game, and if you're not in the physical, uh, you're you're the loser at the poker table, as I say. If you show up to the poker table and you don't know who the patsy is, guess what? You're the patsy. And if you don't have physical, you're the guy that's going to lose your wealth. That's going to feed in, you know, to that wealth transfer. And ultimately, you know, that's you know, a lot of what I do is try to educate people on that because, you know, you see a lot of the pain. I see it every day. The pain. I get the pain from people about them coping with the system and. You know, it's a shame, Andrew, that in the last 50, 60 years, uh, the government, the media, the school system has not taught the value of gold and silver so that everybody holds a little. And so the people that have some don't sell it. And you know, a lot of times people come into my store and the first question out of my mouth, and, and I'm working against myself because I'm a dealer, but I'm, the first question out of my mouth is, why are you selling? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, sell a little. I'll, I'll buy a little. Keep some. You know, Find another way to get money. Um, it's funny, and one other thing I wanted to point out, just kind of uh, more on the retail end, because I know that we have a lot of individuals watching this. Uh, people are buying modern day, what I call modern day collectibles, and they'll buy a slab to American Eagle, something like that. And the premiums to the mints are excessive, but in the secondary market, when you go back to sell that, you're not going to get that. If somebody comes into me with a slab 2023 American Eagle, Mint, mint grade 69 because you know that just means it looks really good and it's never been circulated i'm, I'm not going to pay you the mint premium for that i'm going to pay you spot or below spot depending on the market and people need to get into the right product so i always say go to regular bullion first if there's a collectible market you want to be in it's pre-1933 gold here in the u.s different depending on where you are in the world but be very careful with that be very careful what you're buying now the reason i mention that the bullion the low premium bullion, we're sitting in a low premium state right now. Uh, this is a false state introduced, as you've mentioned, uh, by the COMEX and, and that system. 
it creates artificial supply that you have now uh, very eloquently stated is collapsing as people go for the real fiscal. They figured out the game. They're going to the back door for the fiscal. This is something I predicted during Silver Screen three years ago. I said, don't buy the ETFs, go buy the physical yeah. because that's what the big guys are going to do. And what you've illustrated, that's exactly what they're doing. Yep. So don't buy the ETFs. You know, and when premiums are low as a retail buyer, buy now because they're artificially low. When these systems break and they will break, then the premiums are going to be excessive. The prices are going to rise and the premium, see the premium is a measure of supply and demand because the premium is what funds uh, the supply chain. And if there's more demand than supply, which there is, but it's not being shown in the spot market price, that premium has to flex. Last year, the canary in the coal mine, American Eagles, were trading at almost double their silver price in premium. So it was $14, $15, $16 in premium on American Silver Eagle. Why? Because people are going to quality silver and the mint could not put out enough. And so what we're going to see is the rise of that again. If you're a a retail consumer and you're buying an ounce of gold at a time or 50 ounces of silver, those premiums are going to explode so high at one point that you may not be able to afford it. So now is the time. If Because this system is collapsing, because we both illustrated where the big guys are going and getting it right now, because the smart money always knows ahead of time. They have access to information. They know. You know, if you're a retail investor, you need to get in while you can, or you're not going to be able to get in. And I know that people are selling right now to make ends meet, to pay rent, to pay their credit cards. Uh, I have literally people coming from off the street uh, with dumpster diving and they found something they think of value. You know, that's the level we're at in America right now. And that's what the press won't tell you. But if you're in that situation, don't sell your gold and silver. Be careful because that may be the only thing that saves you from what's going to happen economically when it happens. Uh, just be very careful. The big guys know it's coming. They're buying it. They're not telling you. The financial media is not telling you, but I'm telling you, Andrew's telling you, we're telling you what's happening. So please, please, please uh, focus on what's going on in the markets. Don't believe the spot price. Spot price has nothing to do with anything. It's a manipulated price. Look at the flows. The flows are what matter. And obviously the flows or telling us what's going on behind that market. And if you're the small guy here, pay attention to that information. Pay attention to what Andrew is saying on Live from the Vault, what all of his guests say, you know, and follow that and just trust and have faith in that. Because that's what matters. Because this system is a Fagazi. It's a lie. The front end spot price is a lie. And the lie is there to perpetuate the big guys controlling the market. And like you said, Andrew, the rest of the world's working around the big guys. And when that's done, there's not going to be gold and silver for everybody else. The citizens of Canada, Mexico, United States, the UK, Europe, where are you going to get your gold and silver? It's not going to exist. Or you're going to have to pay much higher prices for it. So now's the time to do. If you're, if you're going to buy it, now's the time. Yeah, and, and ultimately the, the spot price will be the actual physical price. It'll be a true supply-demand price. And because, and what you've just described is... That, ev- that process evolving where the miners themselves will start to look at each other and say, hey, um, that's, I can get this from so, so from Tesla and so and so and so forth. And then you, and then you start to completely eliminate the entire cartel here and you come up with, hang on, I'm not willing to sell it. As you just said, I'm not willing to sell it at 23 bucks. It may be that I don't even want to sell it at 50 bucks, but... I'll tell you where the lines cross for me, 70 bucks or or 200 bucks or whatever it is, but it'll be a price that is determined, a spot price that'll be live around the world. You can look at it. That will be the actual price where you can actually buy and sell your, you can find that equilibrium price. And and we're moving there. And you've just described one of the major inputs for that. And I had no idea about this Tesla thing. Certainly knew about investments going to mines, um, but not to the degree, perhaps you've just come from. Uh, uh, you've got some great intel from 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 the, your Toronto visit, where you see you've spoken to a lot of these guys, and you're hearing the same story again and again and again. And this is a change, a change in structure. So I really feel so sorry for the guy who's coming in and trading in his family silver um, um, to get money perhaps all i would say is i feel sorry but is there anything else you could have sold right 
to oh, your keep that. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, 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 and so if it, I guess really, but on the other hand, the people listening right now that have money in the bank, this is a warning. This is a message, as you say. You need to come and see Rob. You need to go invest in Kinesis. You need to come in. You need to get physical right now. Swap those depreciating dollars, pounds, euros into the physical gold and silver. And then you're protected. It's, it's not about making money. This is about wealth protection. And really what you're saying here is actually you're providing a social service here. There's a social side to what you're saying. As you say, you say to people, why are you selling? Well, it's not, you know, you know, you're going over the, the money thing. It's like, it's not about money. It's about really, you know, I need to, I, what I'm trying to do is educate people to make better choices. And that's why I thank you so much for joining us today because you've brought so much to the table. But Rob, you know what? I really need you to come back because we haven't, I mean, you know, people start tuning out after about an hour, you know, it's just like no matter how good how exciting and interesting it is. But I really do want, but before before you go, I was very, very interested in the sound money uh, movement in America. Really got my attention by crikey. And I think Texas kind of led the way here. Um, and so can you just tell me a little bit about how's that going and, and what's your hopes there? Yeah, so real quickly, um, I'm part of a group called Citizens for Sound Money. And by the way, we're not the only group in the United States. We may be one of the most prominent, but there are other groups as well. And I'm trying to get them all united into one umbrella. Yeah. Something I'm doing in the background. But Citizens for Sound Money is essentially a group that's trying to get gold money again explicitly on uh, in state law. Because if you look at the United States, I think it's Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1, whatever the Constitution says, uh, states may... may make nothing other than gold and silver legal tender for debt, I believe is the wording. In other words, gold and silver is money of the land. Well, we have the U.S. dollar. How does that work? Well, the feds came in. The Supreme Court allowed a liberal con um, um, a liberal interpretation of the Constitution, which I don't believe is constitutional, and now we have the, the dollar. But uh, um, Amendment 10 of the Bill of Rights basically gives all power not explicitly delineated in the Constitution to the states and the people. Not only the states, the people. And so both the states and the people have the right to say uh, what money is, essentially. I'm, I'm summarizing this really quickly without getting into logistics. So what we're doing in the state of Florida, New Hampshire, Texas, South Carolina, specifically our group is trying to get laws passed that explicitly provide uh, air cover, if you will, for people to use gold and silver as money explicitly, and that the state uh, financiers and comptrollers can de uh, designate what is truly money in terms of quality of gold and silver and that type of thing and trying to build gold and silver into budgets and stuff like that. One of the things when we talk to the state of Florida, for example, we talk with uh, one of their uh, cap governor uh, cabinet offices and they said, when we're planning to build roads and schools, we can't because inflation kills our budget and we have to raise more money and more money. So we're throwing good money after bad to build the same thing we thought we'd finance five years ago because these projects are long term and inflation has gotten so bad. It's destroying Florida's state budgets, and they want to put gold in the coffers to offset inflation. We're talking the 10th largest economy in the world in Florida, the 8th largest economy in the world in Texas. We're going to be doing this in 2025, uh, trying to get this legisl legislation passed because the states themselves realize inflation's gotten so bad they need to get into gold, but they want to also make it money explicitly for people in their states so that they're not afraid of the feds knocking down their door and saying, why are you using gold and silver as money? And so this movement is very grassroots. There are five or six different of us at the time. I'm, you know, one of my roles is trying to get everybody together in the same room so that we can do this collectively across the United States. But it's a movement. It started as a grassroots movement and it's got a lot of legs. We had bills created in the state of Florida. It's been through committee. I'm told there's a very high chance it'll pass this year. And if it does, uh, both Florida and Texas are 800 pound gorillas. When these states start passing these laws, what you'll see is a lot of other states fall suit. In fact, some of the feedback we got from the smaller states was, well, show me a bigger state doing it and I'll follow because they don't want to be the trailblazer. They feel like they'll get picked on. Mm. But you're not going to pick on the state of Texas or Florida. The state of Texas has stood up to the federal government already. They're not putting up the federal government's crap on the border and they won't do it with money. And so there's a reckoning coming. And the one thing that I've said, in the United States, we have a federal system. 
Okay, we're not run from the top down. That's not the way the Constitution was written. And the states are getting tired of being pushed around on a lot of topics, and they're standing up to the federal government. And the people are standing up to the federal government. The people of Texas and Florida and these other states are rising, and they're saying enough is enough. And we're doing it legally and politically to try to provide additional benefits for people that live in these states. And we're hoping that once some, as some of these big states do it, that movement will flow throughout the rest of the United States you know, to many other places. And I believe, Andrew, that this may be the only thing that actually saves the union from an economic perspective in the United States is getting people to have gold and silver's money. Because if they get the central bank digital currencies in or some other type of fiat currency, I think it's curtains. Because people are going to be destroyed when this economy collapses and they're not going to have the wherewithal to handle it themselves. They're going to be in panic mode, just like when we went through the Great Depression. So we have got to stand up ahead of time and provide them a way that they can maintain value and trade in value and maintain their lifestyles. Okay. And so that's what we're trying to do. I think it's very important. Uh, I've spent a lot of money and time doing this, you know, at my own expense because I believe in this because I want to create a world for my kids where they grow up and they have something uh, and they're not destroyed by, you know, this economic dollar collapse that's coming. And, and hopefully this will inspire people around the world. Uh, we do uh, some of the people come on in my broadcasts, or from the Middle East that are celebrating this, or from Europe that are celebrating. People around the world are listening to our message, and they're taking that back to their local governments. And so mm -hmm. I hope that we spread, you know, this in the wildfires of men that are strong men that are willing to stand up and say enough is enough, and we're taking control. The governments have gone too far, the banks have gone too far, and we're standing up. And it's it's being done right now in Texas, and Florida. And I hope the rest of the world is listening, and um, you know, Australia, Europe. Asia, I hope that they start standing up as well and saying enough is enough with these fiat monetary systems. Let's get back to something that makes sense. Well, well see, the thing is, you're leading the way here. Now, I, I want to know, first thing I want to know how people can support you in this in this endeavor, because it, it's expensive and, and, and I know that you, you, you put a lot, I know you put a lot of time, blood, sweat and tears into it. But what you, what, if you succeed, when you succeed, I'm sorry, when you succeed, in coordinating this group of like-minded people in this fractionally divided world, and it brings this gold and silver brings everyone into the same way of thinking. And when you do that, it's going to spread across the world. It'll spread into this country. We can't do that in this country. We can't do that in Europe. We can't do that in other parts of the world. You have to lead the way. And I believe what you're doing is going to set the standard because people will say, Hang on a minute. Why am I going to accept a digital a central bank digital currency? Look what Texas have done. Look what Florida's done. Look at the all these states in America. Like it'll spread, as you say, it'll spread like wildfire. And so I just want to know how do people support you in this endeavor, Rob? Just go to citizensforsoundmoney.com. There's a donation page there. I have my own donation page on social media. You can donate through me and I give away free silver to everybody that donates at certain levels. I've given away five ounce bars and one ounce coins. I also wanted to shout out to Kinesis because Kinesis has been a huge supporter of this movement in the United States because I believe Kinesis uh, management and board uh, understand the value of money. Of course, they're in that field, but they've been a huge supporter. We've had a lot of other corporate support as well. And, you know, the funny thing is um, if you don't have the money to donate, simply call your state representative. The, the thing about the United States, specifically at local and state level, not as much at the federal level where money has sort of bought off a lot of Congress, I'm, if, if I'm being all honest. At the state and local level, they will listen to you. If I drive down to Austin and I set a meeting with the Congress member, they will listen to me as a citizen because they want to know what how we feel and what we're dealing with and what we want. We're, we're, the, we're, the, we're electing them. They have to respond to us in our system. And while that's still here, which it's still here, we still have a democracy, we need to exercise it. So if you don't have money, you have time. You have yourself. You can speak. You can let people know how you feel about things. If you're frustrated by inflation, if you're frustrated by getting laid off from your job, if you're frustrated by what's going on in your local economy, you know, go to your local and state representatives and let them know. And that has immense power. When that happened in Florida, we got we got the we got the bills created in Florida and we got it through committee based on the backs of individual citizens who drove and showed up and said, I want this. That's what will get it passed. It's not just me doing it on social media or our group lobbying to the state representatives. It's people like you watching this program, 
you can make a difference. We proved it. We proved it that if you go talk to your state legislatures and you talk to your local legislatures, they will listen to you. And the people have the power here. It's still we, the people in the United States. And as long as it's still we, the people, energize yourself and go speak your mind. It does make a huge difference. And that's probably the most important thing that you can do. It's the most important thing of everything we talked about because we're living in, in, a, in, a, in an environment of this side of the pond and, and in many states in America, but in this side of the pond where the bureaucrats have taken over the entire system. It doesn't matter who you elect. They will determine what goes through, what doesn't get through, and they will make sure you fail and that they'll, the right the, the person that, that, that actually represents the bureaucrats the most succeed. So to me, I'm looking, to, I'm looking to your organization. I'm looking to the American people here who have shown, who, who get off their asses. I'm sorry, but get off their asses and do stuff. They are prepared to go out and stand out and do stuff like this. So, you know, this is a great trait. And this is why I have a lot of respect for, for many of my American friends who stand up and do what you're, the kind of stuff you're doing. You have to get out there and do stuff. We're a bit apathetic this side of the pond. People have been gaslighted into thinking, well, I just accept it. Oh, it's terrible. And moan and moan. No, no need to moan. Go and do something. You know, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you for all you do, my friend. And uh, I, 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 you know, we're going to look to see from Kinesis perspective, um, from 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 every perspective, from personal perspective. But this is a, there's a social side to this. I really, really want to um to to tell you how proud we are of of the kind of work you're doing, and uh, we really want to support you. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. Thank you for having me on and the ability to address your audience. And thank you so much for what you do, Andrew. You yourself um, among a lot of people in your generation have been talking about this have spawned new generations like mine and others that are starting to pay attention all the work you've done over the years is is greatly appreciated thank you so much uh i appreciate everything that you do and everything that your organization does bless you my friend thank you for coming yep thank you all right thank you andrew mcguire and robert keats for another fascinating discussion and remember buy physical and make sure it's backed one to one and understand the difference between what Andy calls the casino paper, gold, and silver markets and the actual physical gold and silver markets. They're not the same, and don't be fooled. So there you have it. That's all we have for you today on another amazing episode of Live from the Vault. Please he keep uh, spreading the word here about this channel by hitting the like button. If you haven't already hit that like button by now, hit the like button share this information, subscribe. And if you want to be notified in real time as each episode goes live, all you got to do is click on that bell right there and we'll notify you. And with that, we'll see you next time right here on Live from the Vault. See you then.